Hi everyone, I'll start off today with a rather interesting question. How do you evaluate basic cards? Um, so we look at the runner side and cards that are you know very core set, very vanilla. Draw cards like Diesel and money cards like Sure Gamble. These are very basic, but until today, even with so many expansions released, these cards continue to define efficiency. You are always, always happy to see Diesel and Gamble in the same opening hand. I know I am when I'm playing Shaper. Goodness me, Diesel Gamble is one of the best openings you can ever ask for. Now, let me ask you, if I were to combine Diesel and Gamble into the same card um, that allows you to draw three cards and gain four credits within the same one click by playing this one card, would it be good? It would be insanely powerful, wouldn't it? It would be such a good... Um, starter, <clears throat> a card to play it on your very first click, and it's still relevant throughout the rest of the game. What if I told you this card already exists? Yep, that's right. I'm thinking of Violet Level Clearance here. When you look at it this way, Violet Level Clearance is the epitome of efficiency. We saw that Blue Level Clearance was a step up from Green Level Clearance, but it came with a downside. You had to pay an, an extra click, it was a double, therefore it wasn't that efficient. But Violet Level goes back to the basics, it's not a double, and yet it draws more cards and gains more, well, the same amount credits as Blue Level Clearance. I think that's pretty insane. You lose the extra click, therefore gaining efficiency, and you even draw more cards. How can this card not be good? Of course, some of you will postulate that, well, there is a counter-argument to this. You, firstly, you cannot equate this with runner cards, because unlike Diesel and Show Gamble, this is a co-op card, and we can see that Diesel and Anonymous tip are very differently viewed. Um, a lot Diesel sees almost prevalent play in Shaper, whereas Anonymous tip is almost entirely eschewed, uh, both in and out of NBN Faction. So yeah, um, you cannot evaluate card draw the same way as you can. Uh, in both Runner and Corp, but it's you can't deny that it's efficient still. Um, having seen the rise of CI7, this combo deck uh, that has been empowered by Violet Level Clearance, one has to think that these basic draw and money actions are still really, really powerful, and that leads you to think, what if you were to play Violet Level Clearance out of Cerebral Imaging? I know it's a crazy question to venture, but uh, Rotage, Rotage, whatever you pronounce it, Top 16 at Worlds got me thinking there uh, with a comment one day saying that they were experimenting with Violet Level Clearance in HB Engineering the future. So one has to ask, is it good in ETF? And I think so, I think it is. Of course, you have to keep in mind the downsides. Unlike a gamble tag onto a diesel, this card actually has a rather quite a few downsides. Being a corp card, and a terminal in combination means that you have to think of a way to mitigate the agenda flood. That's the same problem you have with Anonymous Tip. If you have too many agendas in your hand after the draw, you'll find yourself struggling as the corp, as the corp, uh, as, rather, as the runner hits your hand multiple times. This can be mitigated by pre-installing Jackson and then ditching your agendas in the bin. As for it being a terminal, um, well, there is advanced assembly lines in faction. This allows you to install cards like ice and assets that you normally would be forced to pitch because you have to discard down to your maximum hand size. Then what about it being a trashable operation on top of all of that? Well, sure, it makes R&D more porous, but if you're playing this card, you're looking to win quick, win fast, draw all the cards that you need to win before the runner gets to them. In that case, why do you even bother about R&D lock? You should win before the runner gets to that stage with their three R&D interfaces or their double medium digs. So, I'm going to try playing Violet Level Clearance in ETF, and I've been somewhat successful with it. You can say, I managed to come in first place at London BABW last weekend. Um, I won't go out there, I won't venture and say that this is the best fair deck ever created my, by mankind. In fact, I went 3-3 three and three with it on the day. Not the record you're looking for if you're trying to win a tournament. But what I can guarantee is, with this deck, you will have fun games. This is, this is a deck that plays standard Netrunner for the most part, and the best thing is, it does not completely fold to the popular decks of today, which is Run Base Andromeda and Temujin Wizard with Iron Marin. Well, let's see it in action. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, today's game is up against Andromeda, and right away I open with the ideal opening hand. Three eyes, drawing to a fourth one against a criminal. You can't get better than that. This is what you always want to see against criminal, because then you play your standard opening of ice, ice, ice. They cannot land an early Temujin. This is the key to beating a lot of the decks nowadays. Temujin is such a power card, it's insanely good, and a lot of games are often decided by whether the runner is able to get down their first Temujin or not, because the money snowballs them into other factors such as getting their breakers assembled, and uh, getting their console, getting all their setup. This has allowed decks that usually run more expensive rigs to become viable, which is both a good and a bad thing. Um, it makes their end game more inevitable. So anyway, um, I'm able to, as you see here, play the snake, take a credit, and then play violet level clearance. This floods me to six cards in hand, but that's fine. I just have to discard one card, which is a duplicate snake, and give my opponent a go. They play sec testing on archives, and I let them through. It's a magnet on archives. I still let them through because, firstly, I want to play the restructures in my hand. I need the 10 credits for that. But more importantly, I don't really want to show my archives eyes yet because then they can easily react by playing the decoder and then pointing to Mujan on archives. I don't want uh, that easy route for my opponent. But now they pressure archives again, and I have to ask myself, do I really want to give them this free two credits every click, every turn? I say no. You are not going to have that. I'm going to rest the magnet. I have a lot more credits to defend the rest of my servers. I'm good to go. So my opponent doesn't get free money here. So you notice, if my opponent wants to set up their entire rig, which might be, say, Paperclip, Gordian Blade, and Mimic, or Mongoose, they can't do that because they have only 11 credits. They will spend all their money to install their breakers and then have no money to run. That is the worst thing you can be as a criminal, to be poor. So being able to stifle Temujin and sec testing like this is really good. Unfortunately, now I have a problem myself. The Violet level clearance and the aggressive drawing that I've been doing has led to Agenda Flood. I'm not able to get rid of the agendas because I haven't drawn Biotic Labor. And yeah, I don't have a remote set up, so I'm going to set up my remote here and try to get these agendas out ASAP. I've been drawing a few too many. Meanwhile, my opponent continues setting up their rig, but then plays Special Order for Faust. This is very curious. This is a hint that my opponent is going to siphon me next turn. I need to be very aware of this. So I'm going to play an advanced assembly lines here, knowing that my opponent can easily get through the remote. Otherwise, I would play the ABT. Because my opponent showed the passport, I can be fairly sure the magnet will not be siege. But given that my opponent has access to Faust, I'm going to bait them in with this assembly lines. Uh, and my opponent knows that as well. My opponent played special order last turn. They know that I know that they have access to the remote. So my opponent smartly doesn't run my remote here. Because they know that I wouldn't dare to put an agenda in there after having shown the AI breaker. So that's all like, fine and dandy. But now I have to figure out how to ease myself of this bloody agenda flood. Jeez, all five agendas in my hand. I draw again. You have to keep drawing if you're uh, agenda flooded because who knows, you might find a Jackson Howard. Or you might find a way to defend your agendas. And this is what I found. I found the Lotus Field. I can now go for the agenda. Um, my opponent would have to spend 4 cards if they want to get through my Lotus Field Magnet Remote. So hopefully that should help matters. My opponent instead goes for R&D, having drawn the medium. Running second click, I get the best case scenario. A painful face check to fetch out 3 that my opponent is forced to break with proper credits or cards. They cannot click through it. It's second click run. So yeah, my opponent didn't really expect the big eyes on R&D, thinking that I would put something light on R&D and uh, reserve the big eyes for HQ. They were wrong, and as such had to pay quite an expensive price. Three cards and two credits to eat three feedback and plants, just to get the set testing and a medium counter. But that's good for them. That's good, don't get me wrong. Uh, my opponent is actually able to actually uh, get things set up and they can potentially start medium blocking me by simply cl clicking through fair child 3 every turn. In the meantime, I'm forced to score this beta test because I want to churn more agendas through my remote, so I need to clear the remote ASAP. Do I beta test here? Most people would. Having drawn 5 agendas so early on, it makes sense to beta test here because the chance of you hitting an agenda is very low and hitting ice will push you pretty far ahead. However, with this deck, what I found is that my ice is too small. If you've seen my deck list from the beginning of the video, all my ice is very small and most of my big ice have already appeared. Two snacks, two fetch out threes. Oh, for those of you who don't know what snacks are, I'm sorry, I haven't introduced the snack yet. This is a UK meme thing. Uh, snack refers to Cobra. Yeah, 
We love Snake. Okay, um, back to the game. Uh, yeah, I've played too many expensive ice, uh, Lotus Field, Fairchild 3, Snake, too many Snakes at this point, so I didn't think the ABT would yield much, therefore I did not fire it. It also clues my opponent into the fact that I don't really have that many agendas in my hand, but as you saw, I just started drawing to ice. That ABT would have been perfect, oh well. Uh, we'll play safe and see how things go. I'm going to jam the second agenda in the remote, my opponent didn't check the first one, they might not check this one, and even if they do, they will cost them 4 cards, which is pretty precious for an Andromeda player who probably doesn't run levy. However, given that my opponent is running fouls, they probably have levy, so I need to think carefully about it. Again, instead of running my remote, my opponent decided to aim at R&D instead. Thankfully, I put the Architect there. That really deterred my opponent from running there in the same turn. They had to play the Temujin first, and I have 20 credits stashed on that bloody Temujin. Not being able to liberate it off is such a big pain, but now you can be sure that they're going to siege the siege R&D. Of course, I'm forced to score the ABT here. Again, I'm not going to trigger, having seen more ice than before. Um, it's no point triggering at that point. Um, I don't want to throw the game away. So, my opponent goes for R&D with sec testing and Temujin pointed on R&D. So they're going to get 6 credits out of this run, making it rather profitable. After paying up for Passport on Fairchild 3, they're able to come out rather net even-ish and uh, get a medium counter, which is pretty crucial. Now the, And a turning wheel counter at that. So the question is, does my opponent go for R&D again? They might want to. Um, this would be a good time to R&D lock, but instead my opponent sets up for the long game with lots of resources. So now I'm in a very int interesting juncture. I drew into a CVS, it's definitely going on R&D because the medium's getting threatening. That's good. Now, I'm not worried about medium dicks at all because I've seen 6 agendas. There are 9 in my deck, 10 if you include domestic deepers, but that aside, I have 9 agendas, so there are only 3 left in R&D. The chances for my opponent winning on R&D are incredibly slim. If my opponent wants to find a win, it's on HQ. And HQ is amply defended with a snack and a Marcus Batty. So I'm very happy for my opponent to run HQ. In fact, I've been waiting for them to run this, this entire time. Um, we'll see what my opponent does here. So you see how much my opponent has been stifled. With my opponent not being able to capitalize on the economic power of Temujin contracts or security testing, they're, they're very slow they are not able to keep making run after run because the ice is so taxing. And that is why I kind of am attempting to achieve with this deck. Gear check them out of the Temujin and then make it very taxing for them on subsequent uh, iterations. So again, my opponent tunnels into R&D, this time without suck testing pointed at it, so they're going to get three excesses. I could reduce that to one with CVS, but I choose not to. Again, as I said, I'm happy to let my opponent see three cards of R&D at this point um, if it saves me three credits on resing the CVS. So they're going to trash Violet level clearance off the top of R&D. Uh, see the second card. It is a Jackson Howard that they see on the second card. They choose not to trash it, being rather poor at this point. Not that much money. The Temujin is rather... Yeah, the Temujin money isn't coming in fast enough. So I knew that my opponent saw Jackson on top of R&D and chose not to trash it. So I'm going to make my opponent think that this is a Jackson I'm installing in the server when it's actually a Vitruvius. I'm going to get the 6 point out. Now, that was a very interesting juncture. I could, there are two ways I can win. I can win by uh, scoring a food at this point, but I choose not to. I, I'm going for the double agenda win instead because I have a biotic labor in hand. So if I score this 3-2 on the table and then biotic the Vitruvius in my hand, I win. Now my opponent finally feels that there's something not right, goes for HQ. Whoops, it's Snack. Sneaky snack, sneaky snack wins the batty side game, trashes the fouls. Now my opponent's forced to eat the one net, two net damage, and trash a program. Do I choose medium or passport? The choice is brainless. Going back to what I said, um, uh, it's a no-brainer really. Um, I don't really care about R&D pressure at this point, and without breakers, my opponent can't really pressure R&D at all. So I'm gonna trash the passport. Two net damage hits rumor mill. It hits rumor mill and fam. Wow! So not only did my opponent lose a very important breaker, they also lost the Rumor Mill that would counter the Marcus Batty. Had my opponent played the Marcus Batty before, I mean Rumor Mill before running HQ, they would have been in a very much better position. Um, I would not have been able to Batty them, they could have gotten through the remote uh, HQ rather easily. However, I'm not out of the woods just yet. I've scored the Vitruvius, but I'm now down to 3 credits, having paid most of my money into the Snack and the Fetch Out 3. Money runs out very quickly, even with the double restructure opening. Uh, things have markedly slowed down. I have the win in hand, but 
biotic vitruvius, but it will take me a couple of turns to that, get there. So this is a bit of a problem. Not to mention that my opponent now has account siphon pressure. This is something quite significant because the HQ ice, while very painful, is not, it's completely porous. You can easily siphon through HQ and delay me from winning. I'm very worried about legwork at this point because a legwork would put my opponent right back in the game. And the worst thing is they actually find Mongoose, which eats Snake alive. And then they play E-Strike. So I'm going to pause the video here. There's a lot to discuss at this juncture. How would you play my next turn if you were in my shoes? Pause the video and give it a thought. Um, my Mandan Tree draw was Vanilla. I have three agendas in hand, a Biotic Labor and a Jackson Howard. Biotic Vitruvius is obviously the way out, but I'm only on three credits. Have a think. Maybe comment on it in the comment section. I'll tell you my thinking in a short while. Alright, so we know that we need to play Biotic Vitruvius to win. This normally takes six credits, but in this special scenario, it takes seven because um, employee strike has been laid out. Therefore, the combo costs seven credits, which is really annoying because otherwise, taking three credits at this point seems like the perfect play. So what do I do instead? I have two options. One option is to install the Jackson Howe in my hand and double draw, double draw, get rid of the unimportant agendas. This is the coward's way out. This is a wimpy play that gets me nowhere. If I were to play Jackson Howard at this point, I would say that I do not have a clue of what my win condition is. Jackson Howard does not get me to my win condition. I would be like a lost adventurer wandering through the forest with no compass or map, unsure of where I'm supposed to go. This playing Jackson is usually not a bad play. It's something that you're trained to do instinctively and reactively as the corp, no matter which archetype you're playing. But in this particular scenario, Jackson doesn't help you at all. So yeah, it's a rather ineffective move and one that I'm not really considering. It might seem like I should be getting rid of my agendas, but <clears throat> I think people have an aversion to holding too many agendas in hand after repeatedly losing to um, runners who are aggressive on HQ. But really, HQ is rather safe. Look at what's on HQ. How is my opponent going to repeatedly get through fetch out 3? The answer is never. What I instead could do in this situation is to make the far better play of installing Vanilla on HQ. Seeing that my opponent does not have a way through a barrier on HQ, I can safely play the Vanilla on HQ and deter any threats on HQ, be it the legwork that would get my opponent lots of points, or the account siphon, more importantly. That is the main threat that I should be countering this turn, and even if it means paying 2 credits to install the Vanilla on HQ, it's more than worth it. Here's the reasoning. If my opponent has a Siphon in hand, they just play the Siphon and then they can get past the, the Snake by pay, paying one for Mongoose and then clicking through the Fetch Out 3. Note that they have Aaron counters to remove the tags thereafter. So this would be the perfect play that my opponent's looking to play. The, uh, the one play that would devastate me because that brings me further from my win condition. Again, I have to stress again, my win condition is getting to 7 credits. Siphon pulls me away from that. So the obvious answer here is to secure my economy by making sure I'm defended from Siphon, Vernal on HQ is the right choice. Thereafter, I would obviously click for credits because that advances my win condition. The only downside of playing this is that it will take me three turns to win instead of possibly one or two because I'm now at three credits. Next turn, I'll go up to six credits even with clicking for credits. Aha! I knew the Siphon would come. That vanilla saved me. If I click for credits there, I would be so far behind and my opponent would be very far ahead. Whew! Dodge a big bullet there. Now, I'm not going to rest Magnet here to deny the three credits from the sec testing. There's not much point in doing that. Um, it would bring me very, very far away from my win condition. At this point, I'm hoping to top deck a hedge fund or a blue level, uh, violet level clearance. That way, I can get up to seven credits quickly. That didn't happen, so I mandatory draw into an agenda instead and I'm forced to pitch a food into the bin. It's very unlikely that my opponent would run the bin. Normally, you are very worried about doing this against criminal, but because my opponent has a Temujin with lots of money committed on R&D, I can safely do it. Now, I draw into an advanced assembly lines. I have to make a decision here. I can jam one of the three tools in the remote. That's okay, because I have another one to biotic out if need be. Or I can jam this advanced assembly lines into the remote and make my opponent think that that's an agenda and force them to run for it. Seeing that my opponent has breach installed, I decided to go for the advanced assembly lines here because I was half expecting an account siphon 
to land, and I wanted to have at least 3 credits with which to threaten the win. If I jam something in this remote, my opponent cannot play account siphon against me. If they do, they have to click through the fetch out 3 to get the siphon down, that puts me at 3 credits, I can score this agenda in the remote, if they think it's an agenda. So hopefully with this bluff, my opponent is forced to run through this remote, and indeed they do. They spend the first click running through this remote, it's a diversion tri trick, it's a bait. My opponent fell for it, and I'm going to kick them out with the magnet. They have no decoders at all, they can't get through. So this puts me at 5 credits, but it means that my opponent cannot account siphon, because the Fairchild 3 now blocks HQ off, without 3 clicks my opponent cannot siphon. So they then attempt to inside drop this remote, I'm not going to spend all my money to rest the Lotus Field, I'm going to let them hit the lines instead, the advanced lines. With 1 click left, my opponent cannot do anything, by resing the advanced lines, I was able to have enough money, exactly enough, 7 credits, to then biotic out the win. Oof, that diversion tactic. Save me. So I think this game showed you a few of the principles behind this deck. This is not your standard HB ETF deck because it's a lot rushier, faster, jammier than before. Unlike most other HB decks where you are uh, relying on your taxing eyes, their high strength, multi subroutine nature to keep runners out, this one is actually more about the gear checks than tax. I mean, don't be fooled, there might be Fairchild 3s and Architects in here, but this is not a taxing deck. Let's face it, you can never tax out someone running Parasifer, Temujin Contracts, Aaron Moron, Siphon. It's just not gonna happen. So the way to beat these decks is to gear check the heck out of them and score agendas while they are busy setting up. Um, you notice this is why I'm not playing Ichi 1.0 and Eli 1.0 in this deck at all. Completely eschew them. There's just no reason to play these ice when they only buy you one or two turns before they get destroyed or run over by deep medium digs. Instead, I'm going for three snakes. These eyes are very powerful in conjunction with Batty because your opponent cannot click through the subroutines even after getting program trashed. Batty is also very powerful against Andromeda, which is why I'm leaning towards this deck. This deck loses in the late game. If you get to the late game where your opponents completely set up their rig and are medium digging you to death, you've probably already lost the game. At that point, your only plan to win is to Baltic labor a 3-2 agenda or to score domestic sleepers to finish up the game. This is why I stress so so much about rushing to match point. Even if it means having to score global food very early on in the game, you jolly well do that. You have the burst economy to get up to 15, 20 credits as you saw me do very quickly by turn 3. There was a scoring window for global food there, but I would probably not do it against criminal because they tend to be better at contesting remotes. Something slower like a uh, regular wizard without AI breakers, that would be the perfect target to score a food against. If you do not reach match point by the time your opponent is completely set up, you can just concede and move on to your next game. There's no point in playing on. So, is this deck really good? I think a lot of you are asking this question and are waiting to get the deck this. Well, I would exercise some caution in saying that. This deck did okay at best um, in the tournament. As I said, the record was only 50%. It demands a very unconventional playstyle, and granted I might have misplayed during the entire day. However, I think the element of surprise is very important. I got a couple of blowout wins from Marcus Betty because my opponent wasn't expecting it. I got a couple of blowout wins from Snake as well because people simply weren't expecting Cobra in HB. I mean, most HB decks would play Architect over Cobra because they both die to Mimic easily and Architect even is strong against Parasite, whereas Cobra is not. But yeah, this element of surprise was what carried me through to my wins, and that's actually quite important. So if you find yourself losing very often after trying my, my deck out, maybe you just have to admit that um, the element of surprise is just very important, and it's quite important to come up with your own surprise techniques for uh, taking over tournaments by storm. I think that's required now when runners are so strong as they are. That's the way it is. Um, yeah, so had my opponent, this particular opponent, knew about Marcus Betty in my deck, they would have played Rumor Mill before running HQ, and we would have a completely different game, wouldn't we? Yeah? Think about it. In the meantime, thank oh yes, one more thing uh, before I uh, depart. Uh, I've gotten quite a few users asking me, deck this please. Um, from now on, deck this will be included in at the end of the video. In the last 20 seconds of the video, I will have links 
uh, the cards on YouTube to my Patreon where I post the deck list. So please don't ask for them in the comments. They are usually at the back of the video. If they are not there, it either means that I'm not planning to, to give out the deck list or um, I might have forgotten, in which case you can poke me. But yes, in general, that is where you can find the deck list. They are not in the video description. So yeah, take note of that. So that's all I have. Thanks for watching and see you around.